Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. All right, scumbag. Game over. We finally found you. Now, I'm going to take a seat. We got you cornered. No use running. Now spill the beans. Tell us everything you've done as I flip my chair around and sit in it backwards. Menacingly. And don't think of crying for help, either. You're in the one place no one would ever dare to go. Applebee's. What are you doing? You're on that side of the table. Yeah, we're interrogating you. What? We found your clue in New York. We know it was you, Tombot. Dun, dun, dun. What are you talking about? I'm not Tombot. He is. That's just something Tombot would say the former question labels you as suspect or sus, 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 as the tiny humans will say that's it i'm throwing my chair for chick up and throw trailed you all the way here too you were too obvious no no i'm not the imposter it's him it's it it's wait am i no, no, I can't be the imposter. That doesn't make any sense. I'm the real Tom. Am I? I mean, I feel real, but could I be fake? I mean, what did I eat? Where am I? Who? You know, maybe I am the imposter. You know, Dan, I'd call that a confession. Oh, yeah, definitely a confession. That's right. Now tell us. Why did you with showering with pesticides will help more fuller look hair growth steal what you What? Don't wait for the translation! Answer me now! Ha! Yes, Star Trek 6 reference. Take a drink. What? Wait, wait, what did Tom just say? Why do you keep making noises like that? It's the future! It's cyberpunk! No, no, do not pour drink into my processor! I mean Yes! Yes. Give me that good recommendation to drink seven glasses. I think that's Tombot. And what makes you think that? Yeah, I can't wait to hear this. Well, for starters, it's a laptop. Oh my god! No! Josh, was Dad supposed to make the cyberpunk mouth foley noises before his head exploded or after? Oh my god! What the shit? Holy moly, Dad was a replicant? Wait, replicants don't explode. This skit doesn't make any sense at all! <laughs> oh my god! They're dead! Their blood, their guts, it's everywhere! They painted the walls! It's disgusting! I'm covered! <laughs> yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Gentlemen, we are on an adventure. First, we're gonna flood the city with blue, with Chadwick Boseman and 21 Bridges. Then it's gonna get chilly with Keith Davey in The Thing. But then after that, we buddy up with Kurt Russell. Welcome to America! And Tango and Cash. Here's where it gets different. We take Sylvester Stallone and Nighthawks, and then we try to figure out who's who. So please pay attention. With Rutger Hauer and Blade Runner. And then put on your hats as we take Harrison Ford to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Hike up those boots and crack those whips because the fire pit is swinging into adventure. Follow Dan, Tom, and Josh as they race the skies and follow the dotted lines to the X that marks the spot of this journey. Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's danger. It's deception. But hopefully there won't be any snakes. Every Tuesday here at the Fire Pit. Gentlemen, I hope we live to tell the tale. And good evening, bots and listeners, and welcome back to the Fire Pit. I'm Tom Rezzy Thompson, and we've got a crazy cyberpunk episode coming to you today. 
after foiling a terrorist plot, we're back in the Golden State for the setting of our next movie. As per our rules, we've taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved them to this one. And now, to give us a look tonight at what we're watching and who we're watching, I cyber send things over to Josh Deep Boop Deep Doot Scoot. You've got mail. Thank you, Tom. Josh, Laser Blast Reginald here. And last week, we followed Sylvester Stallone from a fun, action packed buddy romp to the exact opposite in 1981's Nithics. <laughs> Starring opposite <laughs> Sly was Rutger Howard, and he was playing in his first role in an American film. But let's be honest, it was his first role and a terrible role at that. Oh, he did a decent job. The movie sucked. But tonight, we follow Rutger Hauer to the film he's probably best known for, 1982's Blade Runner, sea film noir movie that started the cyberpunk genre. And to give us a bit of a rundown on the film and a spot of trivia, I'm going to go ahead and uh, send an electronic mail message to my friend Dan. Yep. Blink. Thank you, Josh. Hello, everyone. Dan Silver Jazz Nigel here. And as mentioned tonight, we are watching Blade Runner, also starring Harrison Ford, Rutger Hauer, Sean Young, and Edward James Almos. Uh, it had a release date of June 25th, 1982. So we're recording this episode just a couple days past its uh, 39th birthday. It uh, had a budget of 30 million and a box office return of 41.5 million. So it wasn't quite a success. It, it's Definitely considered a classic movie now, but it was not a box office success. Uh, Josh will probably have more info on that here in a little bit. Um, and we've also talked about that. This movie does share some similarities with other movies that we've had actually on this journey. Um, but it has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 90% with an audience score of 91% and an IMDb of 8 out of 10. So hopefully we're in for a treat tonight. Um, I've never seen this film, but uh, I've always wanted to. So without going into too many more box office numbers, because that is Laser Blast's territory, uh, I do have a little bit of trivia on the film. Kind of like Tango and Cash, this movie had some production drama. Ridley Scott is, uh, at least at this point in his career, was kind of not difficult to work with, but very demanding. And Harrison Ford uh, wanted to kill him <laughs> multiple times. Uh, in fact, uh, the production of this soured Harrison Ford so much that he refused to even talk about this film for a long time. He hated it. Didn't hate the film. He was proud of the work he did on the film, but he just didn't want to talk about the film because the production was a mess. He butted heads with Ridley Scott all the time. It was a very hard production to get into. And because of labor union rules in Hollywood at the time, Ridley Scott couldn't bring over his own crew from England. So he had to go with an American crew. And, um, that's where things started to get a little um, Tyrell Corporation, <laughs> which is the big corporate conglomerate. That's the bad guys are thinking this movie. He showed up on the very first day of filming, decided he wanted the columns of the temple like Tyrell Corp to be set upside down, which then took the swing gang four and a half hours to do. Uh, a British newspaper was interviewing Ridley Scott during production and it trickled back to L.A., the newspaper asked Ridley Scott, what was the difference between a British and American crews? Scott semi-jocularly said that American crews were not as compliant as British crews that he had worked with, whose attitude he characterized as yes, governor. Within a day of that run of that newspaper, within a day of it getting back to the crew, Ridley Scott came to work. The entire crew was wearing custom-made t-shirts that had said, yes, governor, my ass on the front. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Take it, you guys have read the article. <laughs> yeah. Some of them even had shirts later that said, You soar with eagles when you fly with turkeys. <laughs> this is all at the director. Yeah. Um, Scott's sympathizers, the few assistants he had that he could bring over from England, uh, printed up in worst shirts of their own that basically read, Xenophobia sucks. Uh, Scott wore one with a hat reading, Govna, for extra mockery. And the so-called T-shirt war actually eventually helped diffuse tensions on what remained to be a very challenging shoot. <laughs> Another reason why this was such a challenging shoot is because there was a fear of a pending Screen Actors Guild strike looming on the horizon. And they were trying to get the film done because if, the, the, if there was a strike, they'd have no idea how long it would take. So they were filming like 18 hour days trying to get this film done. Uh, apparently when they filmed the climax of the film, Two stuntmen were injured 
so they had to shorten the jump a little bit so that uh, Rutger Howard could make the jump himself. That's uh, when him and Decker, Harrison Ford's character, are chasing each other towards the climax of the film. And Rutger Howard was so exhausted at the end of the shoot that he couldn't even do Roy Batty's famous le- uh, blast monologue. And he simply just collapsed in his trailer and would not wake up. And they had to do the shoot the next day. But... <laughs> when Rutger Hauer woke up the next day, crisis had been averted. There was only not going to be a strike. So they were able to go back on a regular shooting schedule. And the last couple of days of the shoot actually went by. Okay. Um, yeah. So like I said, this movie definitely had some production turmoil. Um, this movie suffered at the box office for the same reason that the thing suffered at the box office. A couple weeks. We watched that movie a few weeks back. It was just a, uh, too dark of a film when E.T. was a family friendly alien science fiction movie that was toppling the box offices at the moment. So uh, it suffered a similar fate to The Thing. And just like The Thing, word of mouth eventually about this movie's uh, production and story and all that eventually allowed it to re- get cult status and critical praise. So just like The Thing, it's now regarded as one of the best groundbreaking films ever. This is eerie and kind of sad. Um, Rutger Hauer passed away in 2019. That's the same year this movie's supposed to take place. I remember that, actually. Yeah, yeah. There, there are memes all over the place about Yes, it. I remember when Rutger Hauer passed away and everyone was sharing the tears and rain quote because that's his you know, death monologue. So, uh, And yes, he died in tw- 2019, which is the same year this movie takes place. Um, and the for any... Future. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, distant, the distant future of 2019. <laughs> Uh, coincidentally, I have a friend who lives in L.A. who said that the, they would have begged for the future to like 2019. It's not as dystopic as it really became. Uh, <laughs> Probably cleaner, too. Yeah. Speaking of cleaner cities, some cities, particularly Shanghai, are looking more and more like Blade Runner's city every every year. Tom Anderson noticed or noted in his documentary called Los Angeles Plays Itself uh, this is because the film's production design was unintentionally reflective of avant-garde city planning. Uh, also, Shanghai and Beijing, which do actually, if you look at their night sky, their night, their skylines at night, they do resemble Los Angeles of uh, Blade Runner. Um, Shanghai and Beijing have become far, far more polluted than Los Angeles has ever been in its history, making them atmospheric dead ringers for the city and Blade Runner. Blade Runner. That is both interesting and depressing. Why is it that the Star Trek futures are never the ones that come true, but all the dystopic ones do? <laughs> because, Tom, it's just, well, I think that question answers itself. <laughs> they um, call it the dirty future for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> and the only other thing I got is, I don't know if there's, we have anyone in the audience that are fans of Ralph Bakshi films, but this film was originally offered to Ralph Bakshi to animate and create the the the. the story do androids dream of electric sheep which is the story this movie's based on uh he passed on it and he recommended ridley scott for the director's chair and the rest is say is history and having seen some of ralph bakshi's animated more adult animated sh- movies i would be interesting to see what batshit crazy stuff he would have come up with for this film yeah 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 i've seen um a few of them and yeah that's he's got a very unique style for other geeks out there that don't know his work he did the animated um movie of the lord of the rings right and he also did uh, the only movie of his i've seen other than those lord of the rings movies was a movie called the wizard oh and yeah. that is like that is like a disney movie on acid like <laughs> it was it's a head trip but we'll talk about that uh if and when we ever do a ralph bakshi film but um anyways that's all i got for trivia tonight like i said it was there was a lot to this film i got more stuff to talk about as we watch the movie and as we go on but I am very curious about these box office numbers because I know that this wasn't a big hit in the box office, but I know it eventually became a cult classic. So, Josh, have any information about the box office? I do. I do. Um, as we know, this film was released on June 25th, 1982. It had an opening of $6.1 million and a total box office run of $27.5 million. It opened in about 1,295 theaters. Um, you guys care to take a guess on what movie was number one in the box office that weekend? June June twenty fifth, nineteen eighty two. Yep. I think I know because it may, was it E. T. It was E. T. Okay. Because we've oh. done this already before once. Remember when we watched the thing? Yes. This movie was released the same weekend as the thing. I was going to say Star Trek uh, to Wrath of Khan because I glimpsed that when I was looking up some meta. But R- uh, Wrath of Khan could... was actually on its fourth week of release. Um, remember the uh, box office, just as a recap, if you really want us to get into it. I'm not going to get into it on this one because we did 
um, on our second episode of this journey with uh, the thing. But number one was E.T. the Extraterrestrial, making $13.7 million on its third week of release. Number two was this movie, Blade Runner, pulling in $6.1 million. And number three was the movie we've got to get to, Firefox, pulling in $5.1 million on its second week. Uh, number four was Rocky Three pulling in $5 million on its fifth week. And at number five was Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, pulling in $4.5 million on its fourth week. And number eight was The Thing. And at number nine was Megaforce, another movie we have to get to. I keep forgetting about Megaforce. Yeah, Megaforce and Firefox are movies we need to get down. Firefox is about the birth of the internet browser, isn't it? I think so. Isn't that when like Clint Eastwood invents a new internet browser? Something like that. Okay. And it just uh, outpaced Netscape. No, oh, cool. Cool. But uh, let's, let's move on to the last reported weekend of... Uh, Blade Runner. Do you guys care to take a guess? What was the number one movie on that weekend? I'll give you a hint. It was the best movie that weekend, and it was its opening weekend. Uh, Wait, what, what, we we just what, asked this question, didn't we? Wasn't this it? is its closing weekend? Its final oh, weekend. What was this? What was the final weekend? Yep, yeah, uh, that was July twenty third, nineteen eighty two. That's the last reported weekend on uh, Box Office Mojo. Uh, and what was your hint again? It's the best little movie you're going to see on this list. Oh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. Oh, God damn it. It was, uh, you even hinted at it. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. My bad. Dolly Parton and Burt Reynolds. Come on, guys. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it's final week of release. Blade Runner um, was at number 16, pulling in $847,000. Um, and number one was the Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, pulling in almost $12 million on its opening weekend. E.T. was still at number two on its seventh week of release, pulling in $11.2 million. I but, mean, uh, that yeah. was the, the, for the last weekend, it's losing to those guys. Isn't uh, that's honorable? Well, I mean, it was still it wasn't in the top ten, but uh, give me two seconds. I wanted to pull up what it placed overall for 1982. Oh, I imagine not very high at uh, oh, all. Yeah, it was at number 29, 29th on uh, for the year 1982. It's actually higher than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, 29th, whereas The Thing was at 43. But that's all I've got for box office. So, uh, Tom, why don't you excite us with the meta? Oh, I always do. I always do. And this is a part of the podcast where you either fast forward or you just step away to do whatever you need to do. Blade Runner! Tagline. Man has made his match. Now it's his problem. Summary. In a dystopian future of 2019 Los Angeles, the grizzled former Blade Runner Rick Deckard, played by Harrison Ford, is called out of retirement when four rogue Nexus 6 replicants illegally enter Earth to find their creator, Dr. Tyrell, played by Joe Turkle. However, Rick finds himself grappling with conflicting emotions. Will he let uncertainty and even empathy get in the way of his duty overall this as nigel has noted is the daddy of cyberpunk as we know it directed by a visionary <laughs> asshole visionary asshole from the sounds of it adapted by some novices but with an incredible cast and amazing special effects which unfortunately despite all that didn't quite find its audience at the time Generally, general info, this, uh, as Nigel's noted, is based on the novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, uh, which was written by one of the lords of dystopic sci-fi himself, Philip K. Dick. I've read a few of his works, and they are just the most optimistic about the future has to hold and about people in general. But speaking of people, behind the camera... This film was produced by Michael Dealey. He was actually one of several people that tried to produce it, but he got it in the end. And it's a good thing, too, because this guy's got solid instincts for films. Mostly to uh, produce his dramas and suspense. And what I kind of call kind of um, veteran revenge films or veteran drama films. Uh, films he's done before. The Deer Hunter. The Italian job, the original one with Michael Caine, not that bullshit one um, from the 2000s, and the David Bowie film, The Man Who Fell to Earth. So when he puts his money in a film, it's going to be a good film and directed by Ridley Scott. Finally, we get a film that's only directed by one person. You can count the number of duds this guy has and still have fingers left over. 
Unfortunately, most of those duds would be Alien Covenant series. He was actually just coming off of Alien when he did this film. He was actually supposed to do Dune instead of this, but he left to do the, um, this film. Uh, mostly a dramatic director with films such as Gladiator, Black Hawk Down, The Martian, and Kingdom of Heaven. And unfortunately, the Alien Covenant series. But, you know, they can't all be winners, I guess. Although I do argue his director's cut of Kingdom of Heaven is a much, 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 much better film. That's why I keep hearing, and I want to see it, because it was all right when I saw it in theaters, but it wasn't like, it didn't wow me. Mm -hmm. it, but, you know, I guess Blade Runner has the same fate, but we'll find that out once we watch it. The writers of this film are a little disappointing. Well, not disappointing. We have another case of people who this is their first time writing. Hampton Fancher and David Peoples, both generally known for suspense and mystery. Some of them would go on to better things. Um, Fancher produced this with Brian Kelly. He wrote the screenplay back in 17, 1977. Um, he, this was his first film, and he's only done Blade Runner stuff ever since. Whereas Peoples, this was only his second film after a documentary he did. And he was actually brought in to rewrite Fancher's screenplay. Fancher had made it about environmental issues, but the Peoples fixed it to be more philosophical. Since making this film, his resume thick with drama and sci-fi. Uh, Leviathan, 12 Monkeys, Unforgiven, and Soldier. The latter two, both Kurt Russell films. Uh, so he uh, he made up for lost time. He definitely picked it up. But in front of the camera, we have a host of actors and actresses. But I'm just going to focus on the big three. Harrison Ford, Rutger Hauer, and Sean Young. Harrison Ford, our protagonist, playing Rick Deckard, grizzled Blade Runner. Performance actor, he does everything. He plays characters, but not really a character actor, hence why he's a performance actor. Uh, he was coming right off of Raiders of the Lost Ark and Empire Strikes Back, and he wasn't too far removed from Apocalypse Now. He was starting his peak with this film. Um, so we're seeing blossoming Harrison Ford with this movie. Uh, as the antagonist, Rutger Hauer, uh, playing Roy Batty, a performance actor as well, almost always the villain, as noted last week, uh, known for drama and suspense. He's our connector from Nighthawks, Josh, not Nithix, Nighthawks. I have no um, idea what you're talking about. Yes, but Josh's pronunciation makes that film more enjoyable. This is not wrong. That was <laughs> That was a bit of a dud. And unfortunately for Rucker Howard, great an actor as he was, he didn't do very good films. Warrior Angels, Scorcher, and Bone Daddy being one of the, his many um, clunkers. But someone who's done a lot of stuff that weren't clunkers, Sean Young, who plays Rachel, the ipso facto love interest. Uh, 125 credited roles under her belt. Character actress. This was one of her earliest roles. Her third, actually. She had done Stripes not long before this with Bill Murray. And since this film, she went on to play in Wall Street, Fatal Instinct, and Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, as Detective Einhorn. Oh, I remember that. Not many people do. It was a big hit in the 90s. And in terms of accolades... This had mixed critical reaction at its time, as Nigel noted. Most people did praise the special effects, but a lot of people thought it focused too much on it and that the story was slow. The Los Angeles Times called it Blade Crawler. And Pat Berman from the State and Columbia Record described it as science fiction pornography. Which was enough to get it some awards. It was nominated for more than a few. It got nominated for Best Original Score from the Academy. It got Best Cinematography from the LA Film Critics Association. Won Best Costume Design and Best Production Design by the British Academy Film Awards. Won Best Dramatic Presentation in the Hugo Awards. Uh, the London Film Critics Circle awarded a Special Achievement Award. And in 2008, it was awarded the Saturn Award for Best DVD Special Edition Release. So it may not have been loved at the time 
time, but it eventually got its due. Prestigious DVD Special Edition Release Award. Suck it, box office. <laughs> but, but that is all for my meta. And now for expectations. Um, I've seen this film before. I think I'm the only one of us three that has. Um, I remember... It, it, it's one of those films that most people told me you absolutely have to see, blah, blah, blah. You haven't seen Blade Runner yet. So a few years back, I was still living in Dayton at the time. I, on a whim, coming home from work, decided, you know what, I'm going to rent it. They had it at my local family video, May It Rest. And I finally sat down, I plopped it in, and then I fell asleep. It would take me two more tries until I finally was able to watch the whole movie all the way through. Nothing against the movie. I enjoyed the movie once I finally did finish it, but it's not a movie you watch while you're coming off of work and are running on like five or six hours sleep. It does take its time. It's scenery porn. And if that's what you love, just gigantic uh, cityscapes, a uh, view of the the grim and gritty deep philosophical ponderings Harrison Ford you know using facial expressions to act as opposed to his usual swagger and a pretty darn good soundtrack I've watched it several times since I have introduced it to people several times since and I'm looking forward to introducing it to you guys today and getting your thoughts and comments uh, whether they are good, bad, or indifferent. What about you, Josh? Uh, what are you expecting from this film? This is your first, yes? Yes, this is my first time watching this film. Um, I would have to say that you've told me about that story for years now on how this film is very boring, especially coming off when Blade Runner, was it 2049, came out? You're all like, that movie is so good, but you don't need to see the first one. You got to watch Blade Runner 2049. So you say how the film is kind of meh or slow um basically gave me the impression that you didn't quite like it even though you know you say you introduce it so i assume you didn't like it but i'm honestly expecting to enjoy it i guess mm -hmm. i don't know i really don't have a lot of expectations for it this film never came across as one of those films that despite its classic status or its uh oh, what's the phrase i'm looking for cult status thank you to me apparently cult status because of its cult status I, I never once had any inclination to watch it i i've had it for years i've owned the movie for years but i've never watched it so yeah i guess i'm just interested to see what it's all about i don't have any high expectations i don't have any low expectations for it i just think it's middle of the bar whatever that phrase is so yeah like i said i'm just meh about it not excited to watch it i was more excited to watch uh the thing i think than i was to watch this mm. yeah that's all i got on this one what about you dan i'm i don't know i'm i'm a little nervous going into this film i tried to watch this movie when i was in high school because i was on this like science fiction kind of kick and i was watching all these classic science fiction films from the 70s and 80s everything i mean from like you know uh the omega man and uh, what they called charlton heston sci-fi uh soylent green Ooh. um but uh, I tried to watch this in high school. I got about 20 minutes in and I shut it off and I never tried to watch it again. I, maybe high school me was just like I was expecting more out of this film than it than I got. You know, it's it's definitely a, a detective story, not so much a shoot 'em up. So mm -hmm. Tom's right. It does take its time getting going. But I've been hearing from people for years that I need to give it another chance. And I had a coworker actually ask me what we're watching tonight. And when I said Blade Runner, the response out of his mouth was, oh, you should have made that a destination film. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I hear nothing but good things about this film. But having tried to watch it, however, that was 20 years ago. Um, yeah, 20 years ago, my, my tastes have changed a little bit, with the exception of Star Trek. So I'm just a little nervous. I think I'm going to like it, but um, I'm kind of 
glad I'm not trying to watch it on a night I got off of work. I have the night off tonight, so I'm kind of glad I'm not trying to watch this having to, having to process everything at work. So, but I'm, I mean, I'm very nervous. I'm nervous that this is going to be one of those classics that everyone's going to look at me funny because I'm not going to like it. <laughs> like, you don't like Blade Runner? Every time you say something about some, a movie like that, people always look at you like you're the one with the problem. So. <laughs> Blade Runner is one of those films where you either love it or you hate it, but there is indifference to it too. You can appreciate it for its, you know, the practical stuff in there, the special effects. Yeah, and I will say this. Honestly, outside of Alien Covenant and Prometheus, those are like the only two Ridley Scott films off the top of my head I can think of that I really don't like. I did not like the theatrical cut of Kingdom of Heaven, but his director's cut of that film is really good. So like when he when the studio wasn't beating him over the head and editing this movie, and apparently the same thing happened with this film. The There's a director's cut of this film that's supposedly much better than the theatrical cut because the studio changed the ending or something like that in his original cut and, and added some something else in the movie that wasn't his original vision. My other really Scott films I love. I love the original Alien. Still think that's one of my favorite movies of all time. Gladiator is actually my top three favorite movies of all time. I love Ridley Scott, so I'm. I think I'm going to like this film. So I mean, you can be forgiven for high school you not digging it. I mean, high school Josh thought the thing was a bore, and uh, I think uh, high school Josh owes current Josh an apology. He does. He was a dick. Yeah, I know. It's interesting when you start talking about uh, Ridley Scott. Or from that perspective, I, I look at this film similarly. Like, I didn't think that Prometheus and was it Alien Covenant. Covenant? Yeah, that was the last one, especially Prometheus. I didn't hate Prometheus, but I did find it a little droll. You know, like I thought it was beautifully shot. I thought the story was kind of like, what's going on here? Granted, that was uh, that thought was, uh, you know, multiplied in Alien Covenant. Mm -hmm. But overall, I'd have to say that I don't hate those films like I do other films. Yeah. But The Martian was amazing. And mm -hmm. having even read the book with that one, he did such a beautiful job with that movie. It was like reading the book didn't it didn't make the movie suck. It just enhanced. Yeah. And, and Ridley Scott's done a wide variety of genres in his directing career. He's not just stuck to one media or one particular type of genre. He hasn't just done science fiction or drama or I think the only films he doesn't do are comedies. Like those are the only, maybe he's just not a funny guy. I don't know. So, <laughs> but the only films he doesn't really do are comedies. Um, but he's done science fiction. He's done thrillers. This movie is basically a film noir. Kingdom of Heaven was historical fiction. Same with Gladiator, historical fiction. So uh, he's done a wide variety of different types of genres. And I've enjoyed every movie of his I've watched with the exception of those two, Prometheus and Alien Covenant. And I've not mm -hmm. seen Blade Runner 2049 to judge it. So... <laughs> He also did the 2010 Robin Hood. Okay, I take that back. There's three Ridley Scott movies I don't like. <laughs> I forgot about that movie. That movie is awful. Oh my God. I will agree with that. You can one. say, say we, and we watched that movie. Say what you want about Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, the, the, the come again, off again accent that uh, Costner had, who fought with who in the editing room. Um, the fist fights on set, whatever. Alan Rickman upstaging Kevin Costner, Kevin Costner getting petty about it. Whatever you want to say about that film, I'll tell you one thing. Something happens in that movie. Yes. <laughs> Whereas Robin, Robin Hood, you're 90 minutes into the film and it's like, uh, you know, I go off on Star Trek 1 all the time. Star Trek 1 takes 90 minutes to get to the plot and R Ridley Scott's Robin Hood is definitely hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for uh, reference to our audience, tonight we are actually watching the Blade Runner final cut. Yes. So this is the uh, Ridley Scott definitive version. Yes. So, um, but so, you know, one nice thing about tonight, though, Nigel, is instead, like, if we do come out of this film not liking it, we'll at least get those looks like, you didn't like that film? Rather than you haven't seen that film? Right. Yeah. I can, I can at least argue why I don't like it. And then people be like, you've got to watch that film. Like, okay. And then you never do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, I guess that's what we thought about it. Unless you guys have any other thoughts. Yeah. So thanks, Josh, for reminding me of Robin Hood. Um, two thousand. That was Tom. Do not bestow nine? that. Um, oh my god! Shit on me. That was, that was all. No, okay. that, wasn't, that wasn't me. That was Tom. But oh Jesus Christ! That movie is fucking awful. Holy shit! <laughs> How do you have that cast and be that awful? 
Yes. Yeah, we're getting early Ridley Scott, thank God, because later Ridley Scott, what's happened, dude? But yeah, that's what we thought about it. I am uh, curious what other people thought about it. Uh, Funny you should mention that, Josh, because I do have a few reviews here. So if you guys want to play a little quiz, we'll see who wins and who gets the honorable task of doing the next round of trivia or quizzing, I should say. Mm, I'm trying to find a way to rhyme quiz and honor, but go ahead, Nigel. What you got? Okay, so there's a theme to these reviews, um, and I'm going to see if you guys can guess the theme, but it's the standard format. IMDb reviews, uh, one through ten. Uh, Anyone who gets the closest without going over gets the point. Uh, If you get it right on the money, then you get two points. Best of five, so we will start with Josh. Good, because I'll give a chance for these idiots to stop blowing up fireworks in the background. (laughs) (laughs) It is that time of the year. No, Tom, that's the police. It's your neighborhood. (laughs) Also that time of the year. (laughs) All right, Josh, you ready? Fire away. All right. Not fireworks, but, you know, questions. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Pissed Off writes, Who are these characters? What do they do? What is Harrison Ford's character? What makes him such a good Blade Runner? I do, however, like some things. The set design, the costumes, and super sexy Sean Young are definite pluses. Maybe I'm just not seeing something. I want to go low, but I think I'm going to go six. I'm going to slice a pie and say four. Josh is closest. That is a seven-star review. Nice. Damn it, shit. I mean, nice. All right. Tom, you ready? Sock it to me. Okay. Story is illogical and extremely confusing. The movie does a very poor job of explaining things. Almost all the characters act really weird and over the top, and the fight scenes are ridiculous. This is from R. Skolek. I'm going to say this is a seven as well. Can you say it one more time? The story is illogical and extremely confusing. The movie does a very poor job of explaining things. Almost all the characters act really weird and over the top, and the fight scenes are ridiculous. I'm going to go four. What did you say, Tom? Seven. Josh is closest. That is a three-star review. Damn. Damn. Okay, I mean, I'd better yay. not... Yay! <laughs> I'd better not get shut out. <laughs> Okay. All right, Josh, you ready? Yep. Okay. I suspect that not many people have actually read the book, which I must say is one of Philip K. Dick's easier to read stories. The translation to film often makes for a quite different experience, and it's not always a happy one. Um, let's go five. Damn it. I was going to go with that one myself. Um, I'm going to say eight. You said five, Josh? Yep. Tom is closest. That is a nine star review. Woo, I'm not getting shut out tonight. I might actually win this. Wow. You could come back. Right. You can have the quiz next time. Oh, I'm going to make it extra spicy, too. All right. Okay, who's uh, next? Uh, Tom? Yes. Tom. Okay. This is one of the worst movies ever made. I can't believe this movie has a cult following. I, I like just about any movie. I even get enjoyment from the straight-to-DVD American Pie movies and other B and C rated schlock. However, this movie is just awful. <laughs> This is probably going to be a 10 star, but I'm going to say (laughs) one star review. Like last time, you stole mine. I'm going to go two. Tom, dead on, one star review. Boom, baby. That's what I thought. I thought it was. uh, All right. Uh, Josh can win. No, no. no. Tom is ahead by one. one. This is the last Uh, question. If If I get this one on the money, I will uh, win. If I get, if I win it, we will go into tiebreaker. Right. Okay. And thank you for reminding me that I don't have a tiebreaker question. Shit. (laughs) No pressure. Pull it out of your ass. Just go to IMDb and pick one. I am. But I try to go down to like towards the bottom. So you guys, so you guys can't just go to IMDb and just figure it out. Oh yeah. I wouldn't do that. I would. I haven't, but I would. So it's Josh's question. Okay. Here we go. Josh's question. Uh, Um, I've seen many a sci-fi movie, but I can't understand why this is considered the end-all be-all movie to model this after, or to model it after. Nice originality, but it seems to crawl at a snail's pace. I prefer Matrix, Matrix, Star Wars, or The Fifth Element over this any day. Um, I'm gonna go six. I'm gonna say five. Congratulations, Tom. It's a five-star review. Boom! Tom wins trivia. I don't have yes. to come up with a tiebreaker. <laughs> Josh is you, cheering. Josh you, sandbagged I mean, uh, this. He damn, sandbagged that it. That sucks. I think. Oh, also, the theme was those are all odd numbered reviews. 
Oh! Yeah, I oh. picked a, a one, a three, a five, a seven, and a nine. Oh, nice. I thought it was all that they were all just salty about the story of this film. <laughs> Which they were. They were all just like, yeah, the story's yeah. Blah, but it looks pretty. Yeah, then that was a lot of the reviews that were in the middle of the road. Um, you know, but we don't care I really thought that the theme you were going for was Tom Play the Music. Close the door. Have a seat. Now, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Reaction time is a factor in this, so please pay attention. Now, answer as quickly as you can. You're sitting at home on a Tuesday. It's after 5 p.m. You want to do something, but there's nothing on TV. What podcast do you decide to listen to, and why is it The Fire Pit? You know what? I can see this one's a thinker. I'll get back to you about it in a bit. But thank you for getting back with us here at the Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and Blade Runner, Tom. The Fire Pit swings into adventure towards Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, and I'm asking all the questions that will help clear up the mystery that will get the team there. And speaking of questions, let's see if the team was ever able to get the answers that they've been asking the questions to. I can fix you guys. I can fix you. Just, I need more super glue. (laughs) Whoa, what's going on here? Yeah, this place is a mess. Ah, 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 brain freeze. Wait, you guys are alive? Oh, 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 no, do not hug me. You're covered in ketchup? It's, it's, I'm covered in you guys. Gross. But salty. Well, we just went to get slushies and we were wondering where you went, but it looks like you've got a thing going on here. <laughs> wait, wait, you went to get slushies and you didn't get me one? Well, I mean, you weren't with us, and they had all these flavors. We didn't know which one you wanted. Do not listen to them. They are replicants. What was that? Oh, that's Tom. It's Tombot. It's still alive? Wait, didn't we shut you down? I am not Tombot. All evidence asserts that you two are... Replic. 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 He's got a point, but I am still super confused. Oh, come on. For fuck's sake, we're flesh and blood. See? Look. Slap, slap, slap. See? Like. Fat, 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 fat. Plus, I just had that brain freeze. Ah, brain freeze again. Stop it. Just stop it. Just... <laughs> All right. I've got my gun pointed at you. So everybody shut up. And prove to me you're you, or I'll start blasting. Oh, for fuck's sake. Okay, Dan checks out. This is easy. We all love Star Trek, and all agree that Star Trek Discovery Season 1 is an underrated gem. Wait a minute. No, it isn't. It's hot garbage. That show is as dumb as early seasons of Family Guy. Ah! Uh oh. Uh oh. No, no, you have not seen the last of... Goodbye. How'd you know that wasn't the real me? Well, Tom would never like anything mainstream. (laughs) Well, this is really going to mess with your heads. What? The shit? (laughs) 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 The fire pit would like to take a moment to encourage everyone listening to always tip your hosts and wait staff. It's a thankless job with thankless pay, so be sure to give them your appreciation and, most of all, your patience. Because you don't know how much of their day has been spent cleaning up after dead replicants. Be generous and be kind. But if you want to be generous to this podcast with an ad commission, or if you want to give us some generous words of encouragement, 
or if you have some generous recommendations for movies and journeys that we should try, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put Fire Pit in the subject line, as well as the purpose of your email. Whether it's for an ad, a journey recommendation, some thoughts that you would like to share, or if you just want to test out that new email typing keyboard you just got, and send it our way. From there, we'll read it, send it to a Blade Runner to track, give it the Voight Kampf test to make sure it's the real deal, and never respond. These things only have a four year lifespan, and uh, we took a bit too long writing that reply. Sorry about that. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. You know what, let's move on to the next question. Do you like pina coladas and getting caught in the rain? Are you not into health food or... Oh, I seem to have grabbed my dating profile by mistake. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go back to the office to get the right test. I'll let you get back to the episode. Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck. And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. I will admit, I'm really digging the soundtrack. There is no soundtrack. <laughs> yes, that was the joke. This is how you know it's fiction. He's smoking indoors in 2019. Well, that went to 11 pretty fucking fast. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> it's your goddamn tortoise. This is for your stupid... He's not actually a replicant. The questions were really that stupid. <laughs> Pop quiz hot shot. <laughs> Don't make eye contact with the gimp. Don't move. Its vision is based on movement. God, with the price of inflation, do you imagine what a skin job costs in LA these days? A little more than a hand job, but less than a blow job. God, I wish we had flying cars. I don't. No, don't. I'm very glad we don't. As I said, it's a, it's absolutely brilliant that they were able to film on location <laughs> in 2019 LA. Still a safer place in 1980s New York. Oh, God, yes. Seriously, if first company to come out with robots like that, the second robot they come out to is going to be a sex bot. And they were going to make billions. Oh, yeah, dude. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. See, Tom, there's animals in the future. Yeah, that's right. They were able to bring back the extinct unicorn. Well, I mean, genetic engineering. They can make replicants. I will admit I'm incredibly bored right now. Well, you have no taste. I like Star Trek, so I guess you're right. <laughs> Damn, dude. I know. <laughs> He oh, went shit. right below the belt. Oh, Where's shit. the ref? Fuck you too. I think we need to start getting Josh's re- replacement yeah. sooner than later. Yeah, and this I mean, was the last episode of the Fire Pit Podcast. With Tom, not Josh and Dan. <laughs> and Edward James almost hits you with a pimp cane. You listen, okay? <laughs> All right. Look, there are rules, okay? And there's your sex spot, Josh. It's cheaper, right? Because you're a robot? I mean, you just have to plug her in first. Like I don't need a condom because you're, it's our, you know, technically you're the condom, right? Well, That's how it works. No, considering they don't really clean those out that often, you'd uh, you probably want a double wrap. It's like going to a website without a firewall. But I'm drunk, and she's yeah. just a robot, so I'm good. You're still gonna want some antivirus protection. You catch? No, no, me. I know which. I know which websites to surf. I have an ad blocker on. Thank God we're going to die before we ever see this. Josh is going to be the first case of electric herpes. God, that guy hit me so hard. I saw a black dude in a breathing mask being lowered into a pit. I got frozen in something. I don't remember. Dan, let it go. He said he got frozen. I said, let it go. Get it? Uh-huh. Oh, he's got it. I just oh. refuse to respond to it. <laughs> got some nice toys here. I have no emotions, and even I'm freaking out, dude. He wants that gimp. That's uh, some nice toys there. <laughs> yeah. 
My birthday is April 10, 2017. How long do I live? Four years. More than you. But I'm already in my 40s. You know, Harrison Ford's character is the same age we are now in this movie. Stop. Okay, shooting an unarmed suspect while fleeing. That's definitely 2019 LAPD. Well, with the gimp. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're getting mileage out of this gimp scene. To make a repair, would you like to be modified? Yeah, I want a bigger... Yeah. Can you do that? Yeah, I just got to swap it out. <laughs> oh, it's like sex in high school. What? Awkward and lots of crying? Oh, yeah, and guns. Didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen. 30 minutes left. It's, we're close, Josh. This is, we're getting to the climax stuff. See? They brought out the gimp. Awesome. It's about to get weird. It's not how you play seven minutes in heaven. <laughs> You're doing it all wrong. Or you don't run out to the balcony of a 50-story building? Well, I mean, not every time. Well, every girl I got put in a closet with did. I've been playing it wrong the whole time. <laughs> Just kidding, I'm still alive. Stab, stab, <laughs> stab, stab. So they have yet to explain what a Blade Runner is yet, right? No, they haven't explained it yet. They explained it in the beginning of the movie. And now... Back to the episode. So that was the godfather of what we know to be cyberpunk, at least 80 cyberpunk, Blade Runner. So Nigel, I believe you're up first. What were your thoughts? Um, not an easy movie to get through. And I don't I don't mean that necessarily in a negative way. This movie takes a long time to set up the world and set up the characters. And honestly, there's only like 45 minutes of like meat of the story. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. It just it kind of feels like a pilot for a Blade Runner TV show at times where like it takes a long time to set up the characters. And this is the world they live in. And this is what they do. And here's replicants. But like I said, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It moved the plot along at a better pace than Nighthawks did last week. But it's a it, it's 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 a movie that I probably need to see again before I can really appreciate what's going on. But you were right on your your during expectations, Tom, where you said that this is not a movie you just plunk down to watch to uh, mindlessly watch. You know what I mean? Like this is just not one of those types of films. I really had to pay attention to what was going on, which is good. You don't want people looking at their phones or whatever while they're watching a movie. But I really had to pay attention to what was going on. And even when I was paying attention to what was going on, I was still kind of lost on some things. But like I said, it was a good movie. Uh, I, I think it's a classic, but I don't know if I'm in a hurry to see it again. Okay. What about you, Josh? Hated it. <laughs> we know. <laughs> All right. Well, I, everything that I'm going to say, I'm going to put a tiny asterisk up uh, behind it, and I'll get to that in a second. But um, I will say that this movie was incredibly boring. I'm probably going to get hung for this by people who actually enjoy this film. I did not like it. Um, I felt like you guys are like, it's going to get to the point. Oh, just wait here. And then the credits rolled, and I was like, oh, okay, there it is. <laughs> nice it's fair yeah i should not have been i should not have took a drink <laughs> i need a minute hang on go on josh I, I went up my nose but yeah it's like this movie tested my add hard <laughs> and i failed miserably i probably spent a good portion of this film on my phone because I was just so tediously bored the entire movie. It's like I would try to pay attention to certain aspects. It seemed important. And then I found myself wavering towards my phone. I even put my phone outside of arm's length so I could try to pay attention. And then I found myself leaning over towards it. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize I was doing that. Kind of an unconscious reaction just to get my phone because it's what I do when I'm bored. The last 30 minutes, I think tom was trying to hint at was supposed to be exciting i paid attention but i was not entertained if that makes sense so mm -hmm. i'll get to the asterisk here in a split second but uh upon first viewing i did not like this movie um i don't see what the big deal is about i've seen better older sci-fi yeah i just 
I didn't like it. But the asterisk, um, I can understand why people like it. I yeah, do, that's fair. Um, Tom said that uh, it's not a movie you want to watch after work, and uh, mm-hmm. I definitely am after work. I haven't be- been feeling the best these past couple of days, so that may be part of it. Um, I do think that I may come back and watch this film. I will never go back and watch Nithix, but I probably will come back and see this one. Because now that I've seen this one, I am curious to see Blade Runner 49, 2049. Only because I've heard that it is a much better film. Because, I, t- Tom, everything you've told me about this movie was about spot on. That it's incredibly boring, it's really sl- or slow-paced, and I felt like it lived up exactly to the expectations you laid down. So now I'm curious to see 2049. Just to see mm-hmm. how it sets up with this one, so to speak. And then maybe in one of those situations where I'll watch that movie and they'll be like, okay, now I'm kind of curious about Blade Runner again. You know, it's like I didn't like it the first time. Maybe if I go back and I rewatch it um, and actually pay attention to it, I might enjoy it or I might understand the story a little bit better. Cause I'll be honest, by the end of the movie, I was just like, I didn't even know who characters were. Like I said, I spent most of the movie on my phone because I was that bored with the film. And I tried to pay attention. I tried. But I had no idea the relationships between the people. I had no idea the uh, motivations behind most of them. So, yeah, I just, I didn't like it. Mostly because I didn't watch it. (laughs) Because it was so boring. (laughs) I, I can see that the movie has depth. I see that it has depth. It isn't shallow. But I'm not in a rush to watch this one again. But I honestly probably will see it at some point again in the future but not Mm -hmm. tomorrow that's for damn sure those are my thoughts how about you tom well i love that you covered your butt at the end there josh very well done just like i see the value in this people who are going to email us i do but like night night talks no that was a terrible shit film i'm never gonna watch that one again yeah, that, that's oh, my no. thing too. Like before Tom gets, well, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'm gonna let Tom yeah. get his thoughts in, and I'll say something. Well, I'm not. My thoughts aren't going to be long, really. I've seen this a couple dozen times, and anything I could say really has been said for the past twenty to thirty years by everyone on the internet. This is a piece of meat that has been picked apart and examined by every film major and would be philosopher and futurologist and theologist you know all the symbolism you can pick out the animal motifs the music so really there's nothing i can say that will be new the crux of it is i remember the first time i saw this film and your reactions and responses aren't too far off from my own josh kudos to you you made it through on the first try uh you did much better than I did in the past. So, and you're running on sick and only a couple hours of sleep. Right there, I tip my hat to you. I think we can just really jump into the conversation part of this. I'm going to start by building on what you both have said. Nigel, you were talking about how it had this whole universe to it. I think that's why it's so inspired the cyberpunk genre like it did because it offered such a world a natural living breathing world that you know you had the his case trying to find these replicants but you'd have these pan shots of all these people living their lives and just a stacked city with all this architecture yeah, and yeah. And one thing i liked about the movie is it did look like a very 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 lived in universe like, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. like that's one thing Star Trek doesn't really do well. At least the newer shows are getting better about it. But the older Star Trek shows like they show a utopian future, but it doesn't look like people actually live there. Like all the homes look like model homes. All the streets are, you know, super clean and, and all this other stuff. People wear super clean clothing and all yeah, that. Whereas the plastic the, was just peeled off all the electronics. Exactly. All, yeah. You, you, it looks like they just picked it all up from the Apple store yesterday and put it all mm-hmm. up on the shelf. Whereas like. This universe looks very lived in. Like this looks like it could be your city. I mean, it's a futuristic city, but it looks like it could be your city with the the different shops, the different restaurants, the people bustling about, living their lives, going to work, going to the whorehouses and the the <laughs> bars and the other places. So it looks like a very used used and lived in universe. It's something that Ridley Scott did really well in the first Alien film too. Like 
mm-hmm. a very used, lived-in universe. Mm. I think they call that the dirty future. Yeah, it's a stark contrast to what Star Trek would show. And Star Wars, is, it shows that too. Star Wars was pretty good about showing a very lived-in, used future. But um, mm-hmm. yeah. And that kind of lends itself to people coming up with characters and stories that could fit Mm -hmm. if not in this universe itself but in a similar universe we have tyrell like business guys and cops on the ground and just people making their way and living it and josh this is why i think it also for your end why it kind of doesn't really excite you or like it's because it's really nothing you haven't seen done a hundred times already this was new for the 80s but people since then have taken the things that made it so appealing and have like built on it made it a little more let's be honest exciting um palatable to modern audiences faster paced more shooting darker grimmer edgier or just uh for the philosophical aspects deeper even than this film goes so for your side you're watching this i can see why it doesn't like grab you I'm mean, even Star Wars nowadays. It picks up a bit from this sort of genre. Oh yeah, here like, and I there. remember after Rogue One came out, I went and watched Rogue One in theaters, and then like the next day, I went and I watched A New Hope. Mm-hmm. Relative to Rogue One, A New Hope is incredibly slow, and that was just filmmaking in the '70s. I don't acknowledge, or I still acknowledge that it's a great film, but it is just slow, especially when put in a sequential order next to a uh, rogue one you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so I, I don't i don't judge either of you guys for your opinions i i love hearing your opinions in fact josh even your opinion where you're just like eh, not my cup of tea yeah cause... like i said it was a decent film i can I, i'm with josh i 100 percent would agree with josh when he said i can see why people like this film and i can definitely see why people like this film mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. this I can really see why this is a very popular movie, especially with film enthusiasts, even more so than us, because this is an example of art film as art. Uh, I can see that. Yeah. yeah. And I don't want to say that to sound pretentious. You know, I'm not saying that to sound like, you know, because I I, somebody a plebe. (laughs) I thought it was pleb, whatever. But (laughs) this is one of those films that a lot of people say, like if someone doesn't like it, they look down on that person because like, oh, well, you're just too dumb to understand it. No, I'm not dumb to understand it. I understood Mm. what was going on in the film. I'd like to watch it again to kind of understand it a little bit better. But it wasn't like something that I would get into. And I can definitely see why high school Dan turned this off after about 20 minutes. Like, okay, yeah, this isn't Mm -hmm. going anywhere. If I wasn't watching this with you guys, it would have been shut off. after. Like, I mean, yeah, exactly. This is why high school Dan shut it off. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to watch Total Recall. I'm going to go watch the chick with the three knockers. (laughs) That's cyberpunk. But Total Recall is an example of something that was inspired by this film with the cyberpunk genre. So, well, that's a Philip K. It's based on a Philip K. Dick. Uh, yeah, story. it is. So, but yeah, I'm just saying that I can see why people like this. And this is an example of film as art. And I'm not saying that to be pretentious. I'm just saying that because this is art. Like, and art mm-hmm. is subjective and it's not for everybody. But sometimes, even though if it's not art for you, you can see why somebody else appreciates it. And it did take me a couple of viewings to really get into it it's like kind of like uh watchmen the graphic novel series like the first time you read it there's just so much supplemental material and everything in there you just you skim through the story or just okay but then you read it again and again and you just see all the things you read all the extra stuff you pick up on the themes and everything that grant morrison was doing and it really just gets in your system it really you start to appreciate it more this movie's a lot like that. It's it does benefit from multiple viewings, and I can see that. Like I'm trying to think of the movie that it's just not coming to mind. But it's like I forget what it is. Like I read a short story or I saw something rel- or related to it. I played a game. I don't remember what it was. But is it, it the made... new cyberpunk game that's out? Like this? No. That's definitely inspired by this film. <laughs> Glitchy, broken, and dirty. Yeah. It takes forever to get to the point. It was something in universe to whatever I was doing. And then I went, I, I didn't like the movie originally, but then I went back and watched the movie after playing the game, reading the book, something. And then it kind of opened a couple of doors and I ended up really appreciating it later on. Can't think of the movie now or the universe or whatever it was. League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. No. Nobody liked that the fourth time they've watched it or the 
fifth time they watched it or the first time they watched it. They didn't like it when they were making it. Yeah. yeah. But uh, like, I, I can see myself watching 2049 now that I've seen this one, because that seems to be a running trend with me. It's like, especially if a movie has a sequel, all the way back to our first destination film, when we watched Independence Day, I went back and I watched Independence Day Resurgence. Um, and if we had watch a movie like The Thing, I watched The Thing prequel when we finished that one. I can see myself picking up 2049 now that I have seen this one. Mm-hmm. So, and I can see myself after watching 2049 wondering what some of the things that's going on in that one are really about reading some of the trivia on it and then going back and kind of rewatching this one through more experienced eyes, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I I guess I should live a little warning. It's still 2049 is still a, let's call it a slow paced film, but compared to this one, it definitely a little snappier. Well, I want to say my dad said he really enjoyed 2049 as well. Um, I don't know if he has thoughts on Blade Runner, but uh, I know he liked 2049. I think he liked 2049. I don't know if I'm crossing memories here, but you know, I'll probably give that one a shot in the next few days. If I don't report back here, I'll report back on Discord, so keep an eye out for that. Let us know. Personally, I would hope you save it for when we watch it here, because I'm loving your thoughts, both of you, on the film and just what you're what you're taking from it so i'd love to hear initial thoughts after it happened when you see that film but that's just me see it at your leisure yeah and well i don't it's one of those things i don't know if we're going to be getting to it anytime soon so it's likely gonna well could happen sooner it might more than likely gonna happen we can't go to it after indiana jones because it's a harris it'd be a harrison ford no, but uh, I mean, it's got it does have Harrison Ford and it does have uh, Ryan Gosling in it. So, I mean, it's definitely not. Yeah. This movie reminded me a lot of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, yeah like that's a good comparison. Well, I mean, I think it's slightly better than 2001. But oh, my, it's got the best, most riveting 45 minutes of film ever is the last 45 minutes of 2001. Not ever, but I mean, some of the best like last act of a film i've ever seen in my life unfortunately the first two acts are like oh my god something please happen yeah yeah, 2001 is a very 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 hard film to watch (laughs) i get what you're talking about and it's another it's another one too where when you tell people either you've not seen it or you don't like it they're they always try to pick it apart say well you you just you you just didn't understand it no i understood it it was a boring film Like, it's like, yeah, but what about that scene where, you know, he, he's trying to deactivate Hal and he blows him out of the airlock? Yeah, that's the last 30 minutes. Unfortunately, you got to get to the first two to get to it. Yeah. You have to evolve with the monkeys yeah. in real time. Yeah, yeah, it's like let's Star Trek, the motion pictures like that. The last half hour, that film's actually really good when they're going inside V'ger and they're talking to V'ger and doing all that stuff. Unfortunately, there's two hours before you even get to that part of fucking nothing happening. I'm not as harsh on this because this movie did kind of capture me relatively earlier than those two films did. But this movie, I thought the the, the chase, the, that whole tense scene with Roy Batty was awesome. Of course, the tears and rain scene is classic and it's just amazing. But I had to get through two hours of the film before I got to that part. So, yeah, the last 30 minutes is riveting. The the the, the 90 minutes preceding that was a little not so much. <laughs> so, Although I'm going to nitpick the um, Blade Runner a little bit. Roy Batty carrying that bird around that for those last 10 minutes was, was like, dude, you, you've thought about this speech ahead of time, haven't you? You like, oh, oh, be cool, so cool. And when I when I give the speech, I let the bird go. Oh, that's going to look so cool. You overthought it, dude. Yeah, just. Dude, I was wondering where the fuck the bird came from. <laughs> like, he, he popped his head out and he's running, like, because they don't show any picking up of the bird. <laughs> and then like he just shows up and he's on the roof with the bird. And I'm like, where's the bird come from? <laughs> what <laughs> it is this bird? Yeah, that's a little distracting uh, up, upon later viewings. And a little distracting, too, on the first viewing. Like, where'd the fucking bird come from? Yeah, I mean, I didn't even think about that. All I was thinking about when I saw it was I remember reading in my when I was looking up trivia that Rutger Howard had not ad lib that, but it's like added that to his character. Like that was just one of those things he thought his character would do. Why? I don't know. Didn't really explain it. And he's gone now, so I can't really ask him, <laughs> but uh, yeah. That'd I'm be one of those things to where, and heaven forbid me saying they would add any extra to this film, 
But, uh, <laughs> it's already running at two hours and ten minutes. But uh, like like him showing at least picking up the bird from inside and shoving it up his ass or something. Damn God! Because <laughs> that's literally where he pulled that bird out of was his ass. I mean, maybe maybe that's part of his. No, you're uh, supposed to say you're had... not wrong. Well, you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was part of his replicant design. He was a warrior and also storage unit. And he made more offhand sex jokes than I did. Come on. <laughs> well, when you have a pigeon up your ass for four it years. It was a job... dove. Wait. <laughs> yes. <laughs> John Woo has words. <laughs> John Woo saw this film. He's like, yes, but more of it. Twice as many in twice every movie. Many. Yeah, twice as many. And let's have John Travolta and Nick Cage switch places. We'll take his face off. Hey, that film was excellent. We need to get to that film. <laughs> we have got to get to face off at some point. Peak John Woo. Oh my Dude, God. Yes. We need to get to face off. And if we ever have a bad movie destination film, <laughs> that needs to be one of them. I wouldn't consider face off to be a bad film. But, well, okay. It's a bad film, but it's a bad film. It's, but it's, it's, so fun. it's in that um, tango and cash entertaining bad films, yes. you know, but like, it's been years since I've seen that movie. But that would be such a fun destination bad film. Yeah. Because I do categorize that as a bad film. Like I would categorize. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we, oh. we do need to start coming up with some destinations for season three. So maybe that's one we'll have to put on the table. But I think now that we're talking about movies that aren't Blade Runner, I think, <laughs> I think we've said yeah. all we can say about this film. So yes. do you guys got any other yeah. thoughts? No, nope, I think I'm about. Yeah, I'm out. All right, Tom, take it on out of here. I'd love to. And that's been tonight's show. As a reminder, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever fine podcasts are sold. Our regular episodes are Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Please like and subscribe on whatever medium you choose as we really appreciate it. And it really helps us out. And while you're at it, Tell people who are listening that you've recommended this to to also review our podcast. Give that that five star, that thumbs up, that smiley face, that pie on a windowsill. I don't know, whatever emote that says we're awesome. Do that. And that will help people see us better who will then also be able to comment on the podcast and so on and so forth until, well, until that, you know, we start making money on this or just you know it comes back around either way do your part and uh if you want to continue the conversation um after listening to our episodes be sure to hit us up on discord it's a fun little social uh network type thing where we get to go in and chat about stuff you can find a link on our uh, episode's description at discord.me slash fire pit not only can you join in and have a conversation with us you can join in and have a conversation with other listeners get notifications of new shows we like to talk about stuff certain things share clips and whatnot it's a good time so hop on in um we will see you then i said um way too many times when i said that go where your editor will make sure everyone hears each and every one of them i appreciate that tom thank you that's why he's the best editor the best and as a reminder, you can email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. If you want to send us a long message, a short message, a happy message, a sad message, doesn't matter. We're not going to read any of them. Also, please like our page on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at firepitcce. Both are linked in the episode's description as well at firepit.podbean.com. And I'll just correct you a little bit, Then We will read your emails. We're just never going to respond. That sexy voiced man in the interspersal segment, we'll let you know oh. about that. But from my end, I'd like to shout out the two bits of things that are able to help make this podcast possible. Zencaster being number one. Zencaster is the online tool which we utilize to record this podcast. It's like Skype, only it works and has not yet caused us to lose an entire episode. Unlike Skype, it allows you... The ability to record separately, which makes editing so much easier. And it's free. You can pay for the full version if you want, but you don't have to. And considering they're not paying us to plug them like this, we're not going to insist on it either. So if you want to record a podcast or just want to talk to friends, Zencaster has not yet let us down, and I doubt it will you. But if you do want to host a podcast... 
Podbean.com is where we host currently. Podbean.com is home to Critical Role and many other podcasts out there. And we are quite proud that they are letting us host ours there as well. It's got various tiers, which you can choose and pay. Uh, I think they do have a free one if you just have a basic podcast with a few friends and family members. But if you want bigger podcasts, longer, even video stuff, they've got that for you too. Give it a try. And speaking of trying, I'd like to shout out at least two Facebook followers who have tried us out, Lyle and Ken. Lyle and Ken are two of the many hundreds and growing Facebook followers who come to the page, if only to see what we're doing, see the links, see the comments, or actively listen to us. So to you two and the many others out there who have joined and are joining, thank you for helping to keep the fire pits burning. And uh, I would like to shout out the two people who brought me into this world, my uh, parents, my mother and my father, and my dad, often quoted as saying, I brought you into this world, I can take you out. Thanks, Dad. But I'm only shouting them out because it's like, it's been a while since you shouted us out. So I'm shouting you guys out now. And I can't wait to hear you tell me about my shout out. It's going to be awesome. I love you guys. <laughs> shitting on the movie and shitting on his parents. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Grumpy Josh is kind of amazing when you really I love my think parents. About it. They're fantastic people. <laughs> and uh, shout out to Tim. I uh, am actually sick. We were supposed to talk yesterday and I was not up to it. <laughs> I feel like garbage still. Even worse now that I've seen Blade Runner. <laughs> and um, I see the merits, but fuck this film, Josh. <laughs> Quoted. Put that on the box. <laughs> right in Best Buy. Colorized, 2021. <laughs> but no, shout out to Tim. We will reschedule. Hopefully by the time you listen to this, it has been rescheduled. And uh, one final shout out to one Tyrick Thorne for sending us an email a few weeks ago. And we actually responded, so that interspersal guy's full of shit. <laughs> Dan? Yes. Do you have a like shout out? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, Peggy, the OG friend of the channel. Uh, only a couple weeks before she comes down to visit. So looking forward to that. A special shout out to Rob of Rob's Custom PCs, chairman, CEO, and vice president, whatever other positions he has there. <laughs> um, founder, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, Shout out to him again. Congratulations on your engagement. I know that's been a couple of weeks, but I'm still excited for you, buddy. And uh, I would like to give a special shout out to Sync Lounge. Um, this podcast is really possible because of Sync Lounge. It uh, makes it so that we can all watch the same version of the movie at the same time. We don't have to timestamp things. We don't have to uh, fiddle with Netflix accounts or Hulu accounts. So it just makes this podcast, it makes us all being able to watch the same movie at the same time really easy we can pause it and play it and rewind it and do all kinds of things and it's just this podcast is really possible because of sync lounge so special shout out to sync lounge for helping make the fire pit possible ah fantastic and this has been our blast into the future the dark grim future of 2019 but i think we're going to be swinging a little more into the past next film aren't we team on episode 69 nice, nice. <laughs> yes be sure uh, to join us next week as we reach our third destination of season two wow we've already reached our third destination of season two that's kind of amazing we're halfway through season two yeah and our ninth journey since we've started this podcast yeah. so that's exciting. I'm exciting. Or I'm not. You are exciting, Dan. You are, you are very, very exciting. I am an exciting guy, but I'm really excited because next week we are going to one of my favorite movies of all time, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And it's going to be a hell of a destination. We've got uh, some big adventures planned for next week. So please be sure to join us. But until then, I've been Tom. I've been Josh. And I've been Dan. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there. <laughs> hey, Josh, how's it hanging? <clears throat> Ooh, this is good. All right, ready to get to that interrogating?
What? Oh my god. Oh my god, those were replicants too? You guys can't do this to me! I can't take it! I just can't take- Oh my god, Josh was a replicant the whole time?! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Meanwhile... Hmm, did those guys over there just explode too? What is that, like seven now? Jesus! Ah, brain freeze. Dude, it is a mess. I guess it's a good thing we already got the clue, and we didn't have to go to Applebee's. Yeah, perfect timing too. I mean, this place is gonna be swarming with cops soon, what with everyone blowing up over there. Yeah, dude, that Applebee's is a me- You know... Let's be honest, it just looks like Applebee's. Yeah, not like here at Chili's, where it's a celebration of food. Mm-mm-mm. We should probably get out of here anyways. I mean, we've got at least seven days to get to Africa. By the way, do those guys at Applebee's look at all familiar to you? Nah. nah. I want my baby back, baby back, baby back, baby back, baby back. I want my baby back, baby back, baby back. Chili's baby back ribs. Okay, guys, we got to get this before the acapella meet next month. See, people will think that that's a hint for next next. Uh, yeah, one, but it's not. We're not doing an acapella. Don't be <laughs> stupid. <laughs>